Thank you, Dan and the musicians, and welcome uh, tonight. And uh, we started looking at prayer last week. We're going to keep on uh, looking at that in the second part of this two-part series tonight. Um, a few people have commented that they like my jacket. Um, and then some other people commented that they missed my hoodie, so I thought I'd wear both tonight. Um, but anyway, we're going to dive into prayer. Last week, we were looking at prayer, and we were saying that, um, well, two things really. Firstly, we looked at being childlike in prayer. In prayer, we come before our Father as his children. And so we looked at what that means. It means that we, are, um, we don't have any pretense. We come to God honestly and openly. We come to him dependently um, as his children. And looked at how that might affect the way we view our prayer life. And then we looked at that balance between praying honestly for things that we long for and want, and yet praying with open hands, saying, Father, this is what I want, but at the same time saying, but God, if your will is different, then I'm okay with that. And getting that tension between bad, selfish asking, but, but not asking at all, and how some of us slip to one, but others, maybe most of us, can become fatalistic in our prayers, just saying, well, God, whatever. But he doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to be honest. And so what I want to do tonight is carry on from that and just look at a, a number of points I think will be quite practical um, in regards to prayer. Now, my text tonight is not the passage that we had read to us. It's, in fact, the whole Bible. So um, that's why I didn't ask Darren to read the whole thing out. But we're going to look at kind of particularly the New Testament, and it's been really helpful this week um, going through all the New Testament references, all 161 of them, uh, towards prayer and looking at what that has to say to us. So we're going to kind of dive in and uh, look at these, and if you don't take everything away, that's okay, but it might be that, that one or two things will be particularly helpful, uh, and maybe just corrections or challenges or helps in our own prayer lives, and really helpful to do this at the start of the year, isn't it, as we look ahead naturally um, this year and think about how this is going to affect the way we pray. And Also, it's worth saying, as I said last week, I'm not doing this because I'm an expert in prayer. I've been really challenged, and I am continually, by the prayerfulness of others at church. Um, I uh, need to improve as well. Um, and I guess, like I said last week, uh, no one feels that they've made it, um, because it's a relationship. And you don't make it in a relationship. It is continually growing, isn't it? Whether we've been Christians for years, a few weeks, or even if we're not there yet, um, we're all on this together. So, how do we pray? Um, let's look at a few different things tonight, and if we can have the screen on, hopefully it will come through. Great, thanks Dave. Um, firstly, how do we pray? Firstly, I would suggest we need to pray regularly. It's interesting, I meet a lot of people and they say, well, I don't really have set times of prayer. I tend to talk to God when I'm driving, I do, you know, have kind of this ongoing conversation with God. And we just kind of, you know, we don't have long set times, we just do it bits and pieces here and there. Now, I'm not against that at all, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I've often wondered whether they apply, those, of those people who are married, the same principle to their marriages. They say, well, I never go out on dates with my wife, my husband. We just, like, snatch a minute here or snatch a minute there. The idea of, like, you know, we just... Now, of course, that's how relationships work in one sense. You know, you don't just talk at set times. You talk at other times. But your relationship's going to be much the poorer for not having quality time to spend together. And I think we are given so many biblical examples that it's good to, to actually carve out and plan in set times to pray. We see that in the ministry of Jesus. He takes time out, um, sometimes before dawn, at the beginning of the day, to pray, particularly uh, when there were big decisions and big challenges ahead. Setting times to pray. Um, it's interesting, if you look through the book of Psalms, the amount of times the psalmists talk about their prayer in the morning. Um, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you, in Psalm 5. Um, Psalm 59, but I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love. Psalm 88, I cry for help. Lord, in the morning, my prayer comes before you. Psalm 143, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. For I have put my trust in you. And so we do seem to have a kind of biblical principle there. Now it's not a legalistic one. It's not saying that if you don't pray in the morning, God doesn't hear you. But it's kind of practical, isn't it? You know, 
when you get up, the day stretches ahead of you with its hopes, with its fears, with its challenges, with its busyness. And it's just sensible, ahead of all of that, before you dive into it all, to pray, to discipline yourself, to take that time out. And as we'll look at later, it doesn't have to be hours and hours. I am not a morning person, so I'm not saying that I find this easy. But to find time to commit the day to God, it's just so helpful um, before we dive into all the busyness of it. And I remember um, when I was a teenager, the pastor of my church in Leicester gave me some very helpful advice. He said, the battle for the morning after is won the night before. And I said, I could never get up in the morning. He said, that's because you spend too long at night on the internet or doing whatever. And it's interesting in the Bible, the pattern is always evening and morning, not morning and evening. And what we do in the evening affects what we do in the morning. Um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous um, preacher of the last century, um, was known to excuse himself sometimes from an evening engagement and saying, I've got an appointment early tomorrow morning, meaning he was going to pray. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, we all have to be in bed by 10 o'clock or something like that. You know, we can go out, we can you know, enjoy ourselves, but you know, if we're just wasting time in the evening doing nothing much, that will flow over into a morning where we're rushed and then we're into the day without prayer, and our whole lives start to kind of start to unravel, don't they? So much better to make sure we've got sleep so we can pray before we get into the day. So let us pray regularly. Set aside some time, if you can. Now I know for, for some that's a real challenge. Some are doing shift work. If you've got families with young kids, I'm not setting this as a legalistic principle, but it's a helpful guideline, isn't it, where possible. So pray regularly. But to counterbalance that, let me also say, I think the Bible says as well, pray continually. So have set times of prayer. But obviously don't just limit your prayer to 10 minutes or half an hour or whenever in the morning. Pray continually. And we're commanded to do that. Romans 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Now, obviously he's not saying that we do nothing but pray. Um, Clearly, Paul, who wrote this, did other things other than have prayer meetings. But that continual attitude of prayer throughout the day. And 1 Thessalonians, we had read to us, pray continually. And not only is it commanded, but we're given so many examples through the New Testament of people who prayed continually. Just look at any of Paul's letters. And he starts by saying that he's praying continually, giving thanks always for these Christians. Again and again, he says, this is my continual attitude. I'm always praying, not just at certain times, but all the time. Now, what does that look like practically through the day? One of my favorite um, pictures of prayer in the Bible is in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. And you may know the story. Nehemiah um, is cupbearer to the king. And he's asked by the king one day why he's looking so upset. And Nehemiah is thinking to himself, pants. Well, probably not that, but he's probably thinking some kind of ancient equivalent of that expression. He's thinking to himself, oh my goodness, what am I going to say? Because, you know, depending on what I say next, the king might have my head chopped off, because that's what kings did in those days if you were looking unhappy in their presence. Or he might let me go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and fulfill God's purposes in my life in this generation. Fairly big kind of, you know, difference between those two you know, consequences. And so what, is, um, what does Nehemiah say? He says, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. I prayed to the God of heaven, I answered the king. Did he get down on his knees? Did he have a prayer meeting? Did he even close his eyes? I don't think so. I think he prayed something like this. In his head, eyes open, God help! And we can do that, can't we? Just that attitude of prayer is situations come up that we didn't envisage, challenges. God help. We find ourselves in conversation with someone and we get an opportunity to speak about Jesus. Oh, Jesus, please give me wisdom. Um, we get really frustrated. God, give me patience, please. Just that, those arrow prayers throughout the day um, through those situations. And again, you see this in the New Testament. People praying in all kinds of contexts and situations. They're in prison, they're on a mountain, they're in a boat, they're on a journey. They're just about to have a meal, they're in a church service, they're about to be executed. They're praying in every and every, any and every circumstance. 
And what I've found in my life, both positively and negatively from my experience, has been this. When I pray regularly, I'm more likely to pray continually. It's when I start off the day with an attitude of prayer and, and, and commit some time to praying that I'm more likely to naturally turn to God just instinctively through the other parts of the day. When I don't start the day like that, I'm less likely to turn those other challenges to prayer. I'm more likely to turn to despair rather than prayer or panic. So they go together, regular times of coming before God in quiet, on our own, but also continual prayers, arrow prayers, committing ourselves to God, regularly and continually. Okay, so that's the first two points. But what else can we say about prayer? Thirdly, let's pray specifically for prayer. Uh, let's be praying specifically. I think one of our... Um, discouragements in prayer comes from the fact that so often our prayers are too general. Um, we very easily generalize, don't we? I was in a prayer meeting uh, as part of a university mission week, and uh, I remember the first prayer, it was, God bless the university today. And I wanted to kind of stop the prayer meeting and say, oh, just, just stop a second. Okay, when will we know when that prayer has been answered? Okay, will it be at 10.30 when the sun comes out? You know, oh, God has blessed the university. Or when? You know, will it be that fuzzy feeling I'll get, you know, at midday? How will I know when that prayer has been answered? And let's think about it. A lot of our prayers, we would never know when they've been answered because they are so general, aren't they? God bless so and so. God. What are we actually praying for people? I think sometimes we generalize our prayer because we don't want to be discouraged when we don't get answers. Then, of course, we also get discouraged because we'll never get answers if we don't pray specifically. And so what I did this week is I just looked through all of the New Testament prayers or prayer requests just to see what people were praying for in the New Testaments. And it's really interesting. These are things that people prayed for more than once. Uh, they come up two or three or four times. Um, they pray for opportunities for the gospel to share about Jesus. They pray for boldness when they do share about Jesus. They pray for strength in temptation. They pray for safety from persecution, for the removal of suffering, for healing and for health, for the restoration of backsliders, those that have drifted away from Jesus, uh, for increasing knowledge of Jesus, and in particular for increasing faith and hope and love to be worked out in people's lives. Connected to that, they pray for fruit and they pray for their leaders, whether that's their church leaders or their political, governmental leaders. And they're prayers that come up uh, more than twice. And then other prayers that just come up um, once, prayer for workers. We read that if you're reading Read 260 this week in Matthew 9. Uh, for God's kingdom to come, for our needs, for forgiveness, for words to speak when we speak about Jesus, to know God's will, to endure, to keep going for God to be glorified, for wisdom and to do the right thing, for God's Holy Spirit to come into people's lives, and for people to become Christians. Lots of examples. But what's interesting is they're specific. They're not general. And when Paul says he's praying for someone, he doesn't just say, I'm praying for you. He normally tells them what he's praying for them as well. And that can be a really helpful thing. Not just to say to someone, I'm praying for you, but, but what particularly? Are you praying for that person? Now, as I was looking through this list um, of prayers in the New Testament, I was thinking, what does that say about my prayer life and our prayer life in comparison? What did they pray for? What do I pray for? Now, it's not a straitjacket. It's not to say, of course, that you know, if the New Testament doesn't give us an example of it, we can't pray for it. You know? You can pray for your computer. In fact, I have on several frustrated occasions, but the Apostle Paul didn't for obvious reasons. They're not to limit our prayers, but if we spend all our times praying for things that never come up in the Bible and never pray for the things that they did in the Bible, maybe something's kind of gone a bit wrong. It's good to kind of think about that. And I think the main thing that I noticed is this. So often our prayers are for changed circumstances but the Bible prayers are for, change, are for changed people. We pray for changed circumstances, but in the Bible they pray for changed people. I think that's interesting. You know, we pray for people to get jobs, for people to get healed. 
people to get into university. Not wrong, absolutely okay to pray for those things. But are we thinking about the people we are becoming and other people are becoming? You know, often, like we looked at um, before, you know, Paul in Colossians 4 doesn't pray for an open door to his prison. He doesn't pray that his circumstances will change, but he will use his circumstances for God's glory and that God will use him. And sometimes we're always praying for situations to change. That's not wrong. But are we praying for God to change us and to change others through those situations? So not just praying for someone to be healed, but praying that God would give them patience and endurance in their suffering and that their hope would shine brightly in the hospital wards or in the old people's home. Not just praying that someone would get into their first choice university, but whatever university they get into, that, that they would be in a place where they will live for Jesus and speak for him. That you know, whether I get that job or the other job, that, that God would guide me, and whichever one I get, I would honor him through that. Not just praying for changed circumstances, but for changed lives. That we would see more faith, hope, and love working through us. And maybe God will use those circumstances that we don't like to bring about the change that we so desperately need. It's my experience, and I guess for many people who've walked with Jesus longer than me, maybe your experience too, that the things that have most helped grow you to become like Christ have been those painful experiences. Situations that you wouldn't have necessarily prayed for, but things that God has used. Let's pray for changed people, not just changed circumstances. There was another thing that I noticed in all these prayers as well. There's only one prayer that I can find in the Bible, correct me if I'm wrong later, I'm willing to be corrected, but only one prayer I could find in the whole Bible for someone to actually become a Christian. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we pray for that a lot. And it's tucked away in Acts 26, where Paul, actually, he's not praying, he just uses an expression. He says, I pray that you, Agrippa, and all the others will become like me. In other words, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, but not a prisoner like he was. But only one example. And why is that? Obviously, I don't think it's because people like Paul didn't want people to come to know Jesus. I mean, their whole lives were devoted to that task. So why weren't they praying for that to happen? Someone once said something very helpful to me. They said, in terms of praying for our friends that don't yet know Jesus, praying for them to become a Christian should be the last thing you do. I said, what do you mean by that? That's a bit wrong. But they said... Often we just pray for people to become a Christian, but, but how often can God answer that prayer? Once. It, it might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be 10 years or 20 years' time, it might be after your death. You may never see the answer to that prayer. And so we can easily get discouraged, can't we, if we just pray that prayer again and again and nothing happens. But they said there are 101 other prayers that we can pray before that point for people. Prayer that we might get to know people, build relationships, share God's love, demonstrate the hope of the gospel, have opportunities to speak about Jesus. So many specific prayers that we can pray along the line. Often we're just praying the final prayer, but, but let's break it down specifically. It's also very much more encouraging because you might see on a weekly basis some of those prayers being answered, even though the final ultimate prayer hasn't been answered yet. Break those prayers down. So we only see one example of Paul praying for someone to become a Christian, but we ask him several, he asks several times for boldness, for courage, for wisdom, uh, to live right, to speak well, all of those things as well. So let's be specific in our prayer, um, because I think specific prayers will get specific answers, uh, which is also incredibly uh, more encouraging. But then what else can we say about prayer? Pray specifically, but also pray thankfully and I think this is what we can so easily forget but several times again this is commanded Philippians 4 do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God a few years ago I was memorizing with a friend of mine Philippians 4 and it was really funny because they would kind of have the Bible open while I was trying to kind of read it out loud from my head. And I tell you, which was the bit that I always forgot? 
It was that little expression with thanksgiving. I would just kind of plow on through. And that was just my dodgy memory. But actually, maybe it was symptomatic of a real problem in many of us. We're very quick to bring our petitions, but maybe not so quick to bring our thanks. Situations worry us, it's natural to pray. But we get answers. Are we as quick to thank God when we get the answers? But again and again, Colossians 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. 1 Thessalonians again, give thanks in all circumstances. Comes immediately after the command to pray. And again, if you look through at Paul's prayer life and look at his prayers, they're filled to the top with thanksgiving. Again and again, he thanks God for people. And I think this is a really good discipline, isn't it, in our prayers? To look for answer prayers, to look for encouragements. Particularly, you know, if you look at some of these examples, not all of these churches were perfect churches by any means. Paul might have had many reasons to be frustrated with these individuals. But he always started by thanking. And there are many situations that we're concerned about. People that probably annoy us and frustrate us. But can we look for things to pray for, to thank God for in those people first? It's a wonderful discipline, isn't it? And let's make sure that we're bringing our thanks to God and recording answers as well. You know, as well as having a prayer list with our requests on, let's write down those answers. And it will be so encouraging to look back and see what God has done, particularly in those moments when we're tempted to be discouraged and feel that prayer doesn't work. We say, oh yeah, it, yeah, it does. So let's pray thankfully. Also, let's pray individually. Um, not much to say about that other than do it. I mean, Jesus did it. He took time alone to pray and others through the Bible as well. It's important to pray on our own, to have time quiet with God. But of course, alongside that, pray corporately. We see both happening in the Bible. Prayer times on our own with Jesus, but together. And again, not just in a prayer meeting, not just you know, in small group, not just in church, but, but just informally as we meet with other Christians, as we chat about situations. As I said last week, Rather than just sharing and worrying, pray together. Turn those conversations into to prayer times. Um, it doesn't have to become ultra formal. You don't have to set a time to do it. You just do it. Let's pray together um, as a church and also individually. And then let's also, finally, let's pray expectantly. A couple of years ago, I was doing a university mission um, in a certain city with the evangelist Michael Green. In fact, it's the same evangelist that I'm going to be working with uh, next week in Exeter. He's about 82 years old. Um, he's a lovely guy. Um, and he's just passionate and enthusiastic. And I think if I can be half as energetic and as enthusiastic as him at 82, if I ever make it that far, I'll be, uh, I'll be thankful. And something really struck me at the beginning of the week. We met for prayer on the Monday morning. Mixtures of emotions, anticipation, excitement, fear, nerves. And Michael said, let's take some time before the week starts to thank God for all that he is going to do in answer to our prayers. I sat there and I thought for a moment, that's interesting. So expectant was he that God was going to work in answer to our prayers that we were able to thank him for the answers before we'd even prayed. Because God is so generous and so committed to us that we can have that kind of expectation and anticipation. God, I don't know exactly what you're going to do here. I, I can't prescribe everything that's going to happen, but I know you're going to work. So we pray expectantly. Pray in faith. I've been so encouraged and reminded by that this week through our readings in Matthew, those of us that have been following that through, that people came to Jesus with a sense of expectation of what he was able to do. Let's come to Jesus with that kind of expectation. And let's also remember that our God is so good that he can exceed our expectations. Our expectations might be here, but actually what God can do is way beyond that. I love the biblical example of when Peter's in prison. Remember the story in Acts? He's in prison and the disciples have a prayer meeting all night. And they're praying away that Peter will be released in prison. 
And what happens? Peter gets released from prison. The angel comes, releases him. He goes straight to the prayer meeting to tell them the good news, knocks on the door, and they don't believe him. <laughs> they think it's a ghost. It's like they've been praying all night for it to happen, but they didn't actually expect it to happen. So it kind of encourages me that even they had their expectations surpassed. And God can so often, can't he? Exceed our expectations. And in doing so, he encourages to, us to pray more. I love the books by Helen Rosevere. Many of you have read them, um, her biographies and others too. And in it, she tells a story. In fact, the story is so lovely, it's been turned into a children's book that's been wonderfully illustrated. It's worth getting hold of for your children, of the hot water bottle. Some of you may have heard it. Um, she was a missionary in, in the Congo, uh, working as a medical doctor. And one day, a, a baby was born uh, quite prematurely. And so they were doing all they could to try and uh, preserve the life of the baby. But they needed to try and keep the baby warm. They didn't have any of the you know, official incubator equipment. So they were trying to work out what to do. And she thought, what I really need is a hot water bottle. But there they were in the middle of Central Africa. The one thing people don't have in Central Africa is a hot water bottle. So she had to leave the child for a while, and she went to the Sunday school, the children's group that she was teaching. And so she was teaching the children, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds. Um, and at the end, they had a time of prayer, and she said, I um, really want you to pray for this baby that's been born. And she shared what happened, and she explained about the need. And um, she said, well, let's just pray. And one of the little girls got up in the prayer meeting, and she said, God, I really want you to send a hot water bottle um, for that baby, and it needs to come today, not tomorrow. And I also want you to send a dolly to show the baby that you love her. And Helen Rosevere says, when I heard the child pray, my heart sank, because I thought, how on earth is God going to do that? You know, childlike, naive faith, God could never do that. And so she kind of, you know, she prayed a more general prayer. They finished the prayer meeting. She walked back across to her house on the other side um, of the compound. And there was a car outside the house. And by the time she got there, the car had driven off. But when she arrived at the house, there was a parcel um, on the, on the you know, big parcel that had arrived from England. Sorry, from Northern Ireland, uh, where she was from. And so she called over the children. She said, the parcel's arrived. They're going to open us up together. And so they opened it up together. And what was on top of that parcel? A hot water bottle that had been packaged and posted three months before from someone in Northern Ireland who for some reason thought they should send a hot water bottle to Central Africa, for goodness sake. But that's not the end of the story. The little girl um, didn't seem too surprised by this. She said, um, well, that must mean the dolly's in there too. And so she went up to the box, rifled through it, and at the bottom there was a dolly that had been sent with a hot water bottle and a stack of medical equipment. God exceeds our expectations again and again. Has he ever done it for you? I remember um, a few years ago praying with Chris regularly on a daily basis for, quite specifically, that some funding would come in that we could employ another member of staff here at Lansdowne. And we prayed for it each day. And each week I um, asked to see if the giving had gone up at all. And, um, and over the course of about four weeks, it had actually gone down. So I remember saying to Chris, I said, Chris, should we just give up? You know, we've been praying four weeks every day. The giving's gone down. I think we should just quit while we're ahead. Chris said, no, that's the time when you keep going. And so we prayed that morning. I went back into the office next door. The phone rang. And Chris called me through 10 minutes later. So I just had a phone call. I said, right. Um, someone's just phoned up asking if we needed some money for the employment of another staff member. They've just gift aided 80,000 pounds. God answers prayer. To look back, not just with finances, although it's incredible when you look at the trust that we set up and the way God answer, answers prayer there, but in so many situations, God does answer prayer. It is not just a coincidence. A verse that's come back to me again and again, and particularly to the trustees of our trust as we've been praying recently, has been this. He is able to do exceedingly, 
abundantly, above what we ask or imagine. That's our God. He's so great. And he's so good. There's a story told, I don't know whether it's true or not, of Alexander the Great and one of his generals. And this general um, came into the presence of Alexander the Great. He was getting married in a few weeks and he said to Alexander the Great, um, could I have a gift? Could I have some money? And all the other kind of servants were there thinking, oh, what's going to happen? So Alexander the Great said, well, how much would you like? And I don't know what the currency was in those days or, or how they measured it out, but he asked for an extraordinarily large amount. So much so that the other servants in the presence of Alexander the Great kind of, you know, were like, what's he going to do? He's going to get this guy's head chopped off for asking for that much. But he gave it to him. And this guy went off with his money. And the other servants said, what did you do that for? And allegedly, this is what he said. He said, that man has done me a great service. For in asking for such a large amount, he has shown two things. Firstly, that he thinks I'm fabulously wealthy. And secondly, that I'm generous to give. When we pray to God, do we show that we believe that he is fabulously wealthy and generous to give? Because he is. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are good and you're great and you're for us. And as your children, we can come before you with anything and everything. Nothing is too big that you couldn't cope with it. Nothing is too small that you're not bothered about it in everything. With thanksgiving, we can bring our request to you. Thank you that you are our Father and we can be your children. You care for us. But we don't just want to pray more. We want to get to know you more. And we really pray that this year that would happen. For each of us individually, wherever we are in our relationship with you, whether that relationship needs to start or whether it needs to grow, wherever we are, that, that we would know you more because we speak to you more and hear you more. Please help us to get to know you more. If we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're not going to sing quite yet, just before the musicians come up. What I wanted to do, we've looked kind of at what the Bible says about prayer. And I deliberately wanted to leave this right to the end because the danger, as I said at the beginning of prayer, is that we can dive into the kind of practical how do we do it. And I don't want to look at practically how do we do it as much as this is what prayer is. Let's grow our relationship with Jesus. But how do we do it? Um, is there some stuff that, that is really practical and helpful? And I, I just wanted to give three um, pieces of advice, um, very, very practically speaking, before we sing, okay, just for five minutes. Um, and the first of these um, actually came from this book, A Praying Life. Um, how do we pray? Um, I find that even you know, at the age of 31, I forget about stuff. You know, people say to me, oh, can you pray for this? I say, sure, and then I, I forget. Um, and maybe you're kind of the same. So, of course, we need reminders in prayer. Now, what I did for many years is I kind of had a prayer list. And it got longer and longer and longer, and it got kind of unmanageable and unwieldy, and I kind of gave up regularly in my prayer list. And something that um, Paul recommends that I've found really helpful is having not a prayer list, but prayer cards. And um, I started doing this physically, and I went onto an iPhone app um, that did the same thing. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But um, physically, I just got six by four um, little index cards that you got kind of from filing um, systems. And then what he said is, he said, have a number of categories um, for your praying. And so I thought them up. I can um, put these on the internet or something later. But I have categories for family, for people who not yet know Jesus, for people who were, I call prodigals, those that have 
grown up in Christian families but gone away from it, for missionaries, things I'm hoping for, areas of repentance, uh, members of my small group, friends, leaders, people suffering, people that I work with, people that I live with, okay? So they're kind of my categories of prayer. And then within those categories, I have different cards for different people or different situations. And at the top, I just write the person's name. And then I have a blank card. And each day, I pray for one person or one thing from each of the categories, okay? And so some of the categories have 10 or 15 people in. Um, some of them might just have two or three. Uh, and that way, some of them get prayed for more. Some of them get prayed for, for less. So I have these different categories. I have different cards. I put the name at the top, the situation. And then as I pray, I have this blank card. And he says, just before you launch into your prayer, ask God, what should I be praying for this person? It's a great discipline to do. Just stop, pause. This person, what should I pray? Not just you know, their situation, but in terms of their character, their person. How would I love to see this person growing more like Jesus? Are there areas that they obviously would need to grow in and maybe jot those things down think of what you've been reading in the bible ask some of the things that you've been reading in the bible things that you could be praying for that person sometimes god gives us a verse or a scripture that you know particularly is applicable for that person and i write that on the card as well and i start to build up a kind of prayer request on the card and then each time i pray for it i pray through those things i think is there anything else that i need to add and then as answers come in i jot those things down as well um, on the card. So the card doesn't just become a reminder, but it becomes kind of a visual journey in terms of what I'm praying for in that situation or that person. And then I just pray through them um, each day. Um, and I have one from each category, um, pray through as, as many as I can um, on a daily basis. And you can have more categories if you want, you can have as many people as you want in the categories. But I found that really helpful. Um, it's kind of manageable. And it's a way of just making sure that I'm praying regularly, um, but not overwhelming myself with a list that's so long I could never get um, to the end of it. That's a really helpful thing to do. Now, if you own an iPhone, um, and I guess some of us do, there's a really good um, app on the iPhone called Prayer Mate. And that does basically exactly what I've just suggested, but on, a, on, a, uh, on an app. And so you can go for it, it even looks like an index card. And you can write stuff down and you can edit it as you go along and you can add and take away from it as well. So, so I found that really helpful because I travel a lot and I forget things, but I don't always forget, my, rarely forget my phone. Uh, so that's with me, okay? So that's the first thing, use reminders. Now, that's not biblical. You can find something else if it works for you. But I've found that really helpful. So maybe you would as well. Get your phone or, or get, um, get some old-fashioned paper. Secondly, and I found this helpful as well, um, use your voice. Um, it's interesting, if you look in the Bible, most of the prayers we see in the Bible are verbal, kind of audible prayers. You know, how did the disciples know what Jesus was praying for? I think probably because Jesus prayed out loud. They heard him praying, they asked him to help them to pray. Um, we're told in Hebrews that he prayed with loud cries on occasions. And Jesus told the Pharisees not to pray on the street corner because they normally prayed out loud. And obviously, if you're praying on the street corner, you're publicly kind of doing it for a show. It's not that you can't pray silently in public. But, but normally, the practice was that people prayed out loud. Now, some of us feel kind of very self-conscious about this. But, but I've found praying out loud, even when I'm on my own, just somehow helps my prayers become a bit more real. It also helps me concentrate. I'm less likely to wander uh, when I'm praying um, out loud. Um, and I sometimes do that in the car as well. Now, people might think that's kind of weird. What's he doing? But it's fine. I just pretend it's the Bluetooth and it's the hands-free kit. Um, but, but you can pray out loud. But, but doing it, and particularly, you know, maybe when we're repenting of something or confessing some kind of sin, to actually audibly say the words just sometimes is a bit more real than just saying it in our heads, actually spelling it out. Now, maybe you're in a situation where you can't do that without people kind of listening in. Uh, but maybe you can do, what I often would do is I would just kind of pray quietly, uh, kind of in, almost in a whisper, but I would still try and articulate the words to stop me drifting kind of mentally in prayer. Because then it forces me to actually make my prayers into words rather than a kind of thing that ends up becoming a sleep. <laughs> okay? So use your voice, um, whether it's shouting or quietly or whispering under your voice. Articulating our prayers is a really helpful thing to make sure that we're actually praying. And then, um, last piece of advice is this. I found that less is more. 
What do I mean by that? It's very tempting, isn't it? At the beginning of a new year, New Year's resolutions, you hear two sermons on prayer to think, that's it. I need to pray. So you get home tonight, you get a big stack of index cards, and you think of every member of Lansdowne Baptist Church, and you write down their names, and you think of everyone that, you know, at school or at uni, and you end up with this massive prayer system, and you know, after two days, what do you do? Well, you give up, because you just can't physically do it. And I discovered that I was always trying to pray for, you know, lots and lots of situations, but I had such a lot of situations to pray for that often I just gave up because I never felt I had enough time. So the best thing I did was actually cut some stuff out and make it much shorter because I discovered that if I was praying every day for 15 minutes, it was much better than praying you know, once a week for half an hour. So don't try and start with more than you can cope with. Don't you know, go home and think, I'm going to turn into this prayer warrior that's going to pray for three hours every day. No, just, just start small, but start somewhere. And then build it up as you go along. Less is often more. I think you might find that helpful too. But I hope that's been helpful. As I said, this, this book has really been, um, for me, something that I found incredibly helpful. And um, so do grab a copy. Um, we've only got, I think, seven copies. That's all that's left in the UK. It's been so popular, it's kind of sold out. But there'll be more coming in, so I'm sure Darren will um, get us more. So you can leave your name if you don't get down here in time. Okay? Um, so do, do grab that. But most of all, do pray. Um, let's be getting to know our Father. Um, let's grow that relationship. Uh, he's good. And we can do that, can't we? So let's um, remind ourselves in our last hymn of the, the privilege that we have in prayer before the throne of God above. The fact that we can come into God's presence with confidence, with boldness, despite our sin, despite who we are, our insignificance and smallness in comparison to him because of Jesus. That's our, that's our plea. That's our confidence, isn't it? And that's the very basis to all that we'll do. Um, so let's stand and sing this wonderful hymn as we finish.